Well, hi there. Coral snakes are awesome, beautiful, highly venomous elapid snakes. This is the same group of snakes that has things like cobras and sea snakes and really most of the most venomous snakes in the world. They have, and they're well known for this, aposematic coloration. That means they, they've got these like bright warning colors that tell you danger, danger, danger. And one of the big questions that a lot of people often ask or that you at least should be asking yourself is, how do the predators learn to avoid these dangerous, brightly colored snakes? And the answer is, at least most of the time, that they don't. I mean, for starters, if a bite kills you, it's very unlikely that you'll learn uh, very much from the experience. I mean, you know, you'll probably never repeat your mistake with a coral snake, but you know, that'll be because you're dead. They're also pretty unlikely to watch some other animal be bitten. You know, they don't usually look over and they're like, oh, Gary, you're not looking so good, are you? Oh. Gary, Gary's dead. And then they sit back and they go, oh, well, a moment ago I saw him kind of tussling with that brightly colored snake and then he started acting real funny like and then he was, oh. That could happen, but uh, you know, most of the time you're never going to, even if you are a predator, you're never going to be watching some other predator get bitten by a snake and die, so that's pretty unlikely. And then you'd have to be a pretty darn smart predator to put two and two together and figure out what happened to that guy and that it could happen to you. But the, the fact is that when a predator that potentially eats snakes, like coral snakes, encounters a coral snake, it can respond in one of two ways. The first way is that it could attack that snake and die. The other option is it could just walk away and have a much greater chance of reproducing again than one that is dead. Additionally, snakes with colorations that most powerfully elicit that mm, uh, nah, walk away response are the least likely to be attacked, and, and as a result, they're more likely to reproduce again because, you know, even if you're a venomous coral snake, if you're attacked by a hawk or something, even if you manage to kill the animal that attacked you, you still might die from your injuries. So it's a bad deal to be attacked. Thus, coral snakes have been selected upon to have clear indicators of their dangerousness, and predators have been selected to avoid any snakes that have those indicators. And this has benefited coral snakes for a long time. But it has also benefited snakes that resemble coral snakes, like this Pueblan milk snake. Thus, coral snakes aren't the only ones out there that have benefited from the fact that predators have been selected upon to avoid coral snakes. Many snakes, in fact, look at least a little bit like coral snakes. And those that happen to look the most like coral snakes get the biggest benefit from the fact that predators avoid snakes that look like coral snakes. And because snakes that look like the most like coral snakes are the most likely to survive to reproduce, populations of snakes start to look more and more and more like coral snakes over time. And, and this, this fact that they end up looking a heck of a lot like other snakes and they're protected as a result is called Batesian mimicry. These are non-dangerous animals that are protected from predators from the fact that they look like dangerous animals. And they're not necessarily trying to look like dangerous animals. In fact, most of the time, I mean, this snake probably has no idea what a coral snake is, that they even exist, or that that would make any difference in their lives. They're not attempting to look like coral snakes, but if they happen to, they derive a big benefit because they're less likely to be attacked by predators. So that leads to a really big question, which is just, well, why don't all snakes look like coral snakes? For starters, not all populations of snakes have individuals that look like coral snakes at all. Like, for example, this is a western hognose snake, and though there are hognose snakes that look a heck of a lot like coral snakes, I've never seen a western hognose snake that looked anything like a coral snake. And if nobody looks like a coral snake, then the fact that predators avoid coral snakes or any snakes that look like coral snakes has no impact on them whatsoever. You're unprotected all the same. However, even if you do look like a coral snake, that isn't always a good thing. Coral snakes, as it turns out, are very conspicuous. When you're bright red and bright black and bright yellow, 
you stand out in a crowd, or in the bushes, or in the grass, or wherever you are, you're pretty easy to spot. And this becomes really, really relevant if you look like a coral snake, but there are no actual coral snakes anywhere near where you live, because predators won't be selected upon to be afraid of coral snakes. All that will happen is they will see you very easily and be completely not dissuaded by the fact that you look like something that exists elsewhere called the coral snake. Truth is that if you look a lot like a coral snake, you also probably live a lot like a coral snake, and as a result, you compete very directly with coral snakes. This explains not only why there are many snakes that don't mimic coral snakes, but also why there are imperfect mimics like this Yucatan rat snake. But the real question is, where do we find the best coral snake mimics? To begin to answer this question, we need to think about where coral snakes live. And as it turns out, coral snakes don't live everywhere. And interestingly, we find imperfect mimics both inside of the range of the coral snakes and outside of the range of the coral snakes. And the best mimics are found right at the edge of the coral snake range, where coral snakes exist, but are very rare. And this makes sense because outside of the coral snake range, there's little benefit to looking like a coral snake, and yet being brightly colored can be a serious liability. Inside of the coral snake range, especially deep inside where there are lots of coral snakes, you're going to run into the fact that you're going to be competing with a lot of coral snakes. And there's a principle in ecology called competitive exclusion, which essentially deals with the fact that when two organisms are competing for the same resources, generally speaking, one or the other will be kicked out of that environment. They won't be as quite as successful as the other, and as a result, they will end up going extinct, at least in that area. And, and those that don't go extinct generally have something occur where they start to evolve in different directions so that they are less and less alike and they're taking advantage of different microhabitats within that range. Usually, two extremely similar species don't coexist. Another thing about living deep inside of the coral snake range is that the predators there are really, really highly selected upon to avoid coral snakes. They avoid coral snakes like crazy, even if you don't look a heck of a lot like one. This means that you don't actually have to look a whole lot like a coral snake to get the benefits of looking like a coral snake, and the less that you look like one, the less that you end up competing with coral snakes directly, and so selection sort of favors those that look a little bit like coral snakes, but not a whole lot. However, right at the edge of the coral snake habitat, where coral snakes are very, very rare, there isn't very much selection on predators to avoid coral snakes. There also aren't a whole lot of coral snakes there with which to compete. And this means that the costs of looking just like a coral snake are pretty darn low, but yet, you better look exactly like one if you have any hope that the predators are going to avoid you at all. And I think that's pretty rad. I'd also like to take just a moment to say thank you to our patrons at Patreon who make so much possible for this channel. We've been able to grow so much because of you guys and expand our capabilities and things that we can do. And one way that we say thank you is our weekly podcast that we record. It's sort of a little bit less formal, but we discuss some really fun things. And we have definitely discussed mimicry complexes and tons of other cool science like this in those podcasts. So thank you to those of you that support us on Patreon. Also, if you're enjoying this so far and you want me to talk about other cool reptile-related discoveries that are, are being made as sort of cutting-edge science, let me know. Uh, throw something down in the comments. Let me know if you'd like to see more videos like this in the future. I'd like to give some, some big thanks to David Fennig and his lab at the University of North Carolina uh, for really helping me to understand these awesome concepts. I'd also like to say thank you to Animal Ark in Orem, Utah, who provided all the snakes that we used in this video, including this glorious Pueblin milk snake. It is very rare that I find a milk snake with 
perfect, perfect bands. Uh, and I went in there a while back and they had not just one, but three of them. And so I, I marked all of them and two of them are still available. So if you're looking for one of the most glorious and perfect coral snake mimics in the world, uh, contact Animal Ark and say you want one of these because look at them, they're amazing. As always, like and subscribe and we hope to see you real soon. Please. No. Don't do that, please. Come here, son. Gotcha. I'm all slippery. He's got a little piece of substrate on his face that I don't think I can get off. But... Yeah, you can't tell from the camera. Oh, you got it. Booyah. Okay. <laughs> Blew his face off. Would you calm down? Please? Poor scared little danger noodle. There you are. You're all right. You're all right, Penny. This age. Look at me, my bad self. <laughs> like, can you imagine? Imagine, if you will, that you woke up tomorrow. And somebody took your house with you in it, drove you, just stuffed you in a cooler, took you up somewhere, pulled you out. And you know she didn't even have any arms or legs. And then they... I noticed, Tom. Huh? Suddenly. Noticed. Yes. <laughs> and they grab you. And all you can do is try to run. And they're like, no, no, no. They grab you by your tail. Because you have one. <laughs> There's a lot of caveats in this story. Yeah. It just, just takes a little imagination. Just. <laughs> Calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Just sit just for a second. freaking freezing down here. Okay. You see me rolling. Them's is roaring! <laughs> He's going meow meow! meow. <laughs> Something like that. So I have a little present. I'm for, sorry, what? I have a little present. Oh for no. Jason. Oh no. <sighs> what is it? What is this thing? <laughs> Is this yes. a pen comb? It's a pen comb. Oh my uh, god. It's like a gallon uh, pen comb. <laughs> I found them on Amazon this last week and I almost got him one, but this is a better pen comb. This thing. The combs were too big. Look at this thing. I this is this is exactly what I was dreaming of. That's beautiful. This Actually, I do need to turn it. I have meant to do it so you could just flick it forward. <laughs> um. No, this is great. Okay, let's fix. Yeah, yeah. Let's fix. Ooh, there it is. Wait, Inauguration. Oh, no. I need to. I need to work. You gotta on my work craft. on your. Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> All his dreams are coming true. That's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. You're welcome. Oh, glorious day. Here. Great. Okay. Uh huh. Feels like a rooster. Like I said, it's great. Why do you even have that comb? That was true. Mm, I feel ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> we should definitely do a beta video sometime soon. Yeah, we should. And then we'll beta test it. Oh my gosh. Huh? <laughs>